everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Stefan Mueller, also known as Steve. Steve is the head coach of Schwan Gung Fu Academy in Berlin, Germany, formerly known as Wudong Deutschland. Schwan Gung Fu Academy has a daily training program as well as a full-time live-in student program and a teacher education program. And we're going to talk about all of those things and more today with Steve. Stefan, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, thank you. The pleasure's on my side. So you are a professional martial arts teacher and you've been doing martial arts for most of your life. Um, could you tell us how you got started initially in martial arts? Um, yeah, it started around when I was five years old that I got very interested in the martial arts, not really going to courses or anything yet, but more like through friends. And I had a, a friend that was older than me that taught me some things. And then we had like these competitions as children outside a fighting competition and this is where I realized okay this is something I really enjoy and I think with 12 then was a point where really uh, where something switched and I realized okay this is something I really want to do for the rest of my life and maybe even like focus on and so with 12 I started to gradually um, build up my 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 training and uh, my path back What's then that? Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, let me interrupt you. What art were you studying at that time? What what martial art were you studying at that time when you were 12? With, with 12, I was starting with um, Aikido oh. and uh, Taekwondo, not because it was what I really wanted to do. It was more like what was offered in my city. I come from a quite small town. And I mean, from 12, I knew, ah, I want to go to the Shaolin Temple and I want to, to become a Shaolin monk. This was my, my idea back then. And I want to practice Kung Fu. Um, but since there was no offer of Kung Fu in my, my hometown, I was okay. I go to Aikido and Taekwondo. This was what I was offered. And um, next to it, I booked all, uh, I, I bought all the books that I found and also videos. This like old uh, videos from, from China with the, from the Shaolin monks. Um, and I tried to learn from, from this. And this was my start from 12. And... Yeah. Also with 12, the first thing I started in my own training was like I said, like, okay, I will start with uh, 20 push-ups every day. And this is my training. And after a while, I realized this is not enough. And I built this up until 16, maybe. And I was in a regular training frame of three to four hours a day. Wow. And, and for me, the, the logical step was also to say, okay, um, I have to do this more and I have to go to a place that, that is offering this full time. And so when did you find that full-time environment? Um, this was then in um, 2011 with the school here from, from Ismet. Back then was the switch. Uh, also in your podcast with Ismet, you talk about it, that, that one of his students took over the school, Raphael. And I was coming exactly in this uh, switch when Ismet was leaving to China and Rafi took over the school. So it was in 2011. And yeah, that's when I was starting um, to practice full-time. So it was an up from 16. It was another uh, three years with 19. I came then to to the school in Berlin for this full-time program. So you trained for three years before you became a full-time student? Um, no, oh. no. I like I trained from 12 to 16, right. more or less. And then I was in a frame of four hours a day. Then my parents told me, look, you can do all these Kung Fu things later, but first do an education. And this is why I decided, okay, I will uh, leave my city and do an education outside of town. And this was when I started my, not exactly physiotherapist education, but maybe this hits it the best. In, in Germany, there's another education that is very similar. And I wanted to do something that helps me for the martial art, that teaches me about the body. And so I, I uh, uh, choose this kind of study for three years. And after I was finished with that study, I then went to Berlin for the full-time training and of course in this time of study I still trained and because I was in other um, in another city from 16 to 19 I could also finally start with kung fu and then also later then that I discovered okay taiji actually is also something that interests me because um, to go a bit back there again um, in my education um, I got problem with my arms and I couldn't do so much the hard martial arts anymore even aikido was difficult for me to to keep practicing and um, so I was looking for, for other things I can do. And my father always taught me, try Taiji. And I was a bit like this, 
nah, this I do when I'm older, you know, like, uh, and then I, I listened to him because I had this uh, physical problems and I want to do something I can still do during the time. And, um, and this is when I discovered actually, this is what, what I was looking for the whole time. Um, and it's even more interesting for me than the more, maybe back then, like, as I saw it, the Shaolin pass, yeah, more the internal martial art pass, um, direction of Wudang, uh, Kung Fu. And, and this is then also how I found Ismet in the school in Berlin through this. Can you describe what your first meeting with Ismet was like? Um, what, what kind of impression did he make on you at that first meeting? I think I was already quite pre-occupied um, um, because I was coming in a time he was not here anymore. He was already in China. And um, I mean, my first my first contact with him was I was, I was writing him, Ismet, I want to come, I want to be your student. And then he told me, okay, look, I'm now on the way to China. Still come, my student will take care of it. And so this was my first contact. But then later, when I think one year later, he came back to visit uh, Berlin again. And uh, this is when I met him uh, the first time. And yeah, through all the stories that been already around in the room, um, in the school here, I had already quite a picture. And um, yeah, but, but how exactly I, I, I was the impression, I, to be honest, I also don't really remember anymore. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> what, what was your training like in those, days, those early days of your live-in training? Was it uh, what you expected it to be? Did you find Here it in the, in, in the school? Yes. Um, no, absolutely not. Like, of course, and I think this is something many people that experience here that come here, that we have all our ideas and pictures from movies and uh, books and whatever. Um, and then you come here and then, okay, you realize it's not so, it's not exactly that way. Yeah. First thing I, I uh, learned then also was this, uh, yeah, the how to practice really, because I think until this point, I, I didn't really uh, understood how to really build up skill in Kung Fu and how the training works best. Um, and I was training for myself a lot and I was a lot looking, I was a lot struggling with discipline and, and like finding ways to build up discipline and stuff like that. But still uh, my training was always a bit like jumpy. I was doing certain period this and certain period this and certain, certain period this. And I never had this understanding of, okay, do something one time for really like half a year every day and just this, and maybe even longer, because this you don't do from yourself. Because like latest after three months, you do something every day, you start to change things. But then here in the, in the school was the first time that I learned this method of, um, okay, now you do, because Rafi taught me, um, now you do like three, uh, six months, only the tidy steps in your morning training, which was like a session of three to four hours. And for me, it was, I couldn't understand it because I learned before already all the, like some other forms from other students here that been here. I learned really fast through my previous practice. I just uh, could talk with people. They showed me a bit and I could learn this. And um, so I couldn't really understand why Rafi let me do now for half a year, the same things, so like very basic tidy steps. Um, and it made me also almost angry and sometimes really like questioning why I'm here and what I'm doing here now, because my plan was I will come for one year and then I will open my own martial arts school. This was my idea back then. And then I realized after this half year, um, like that through this half year, everything changed. And also my perspective on, on practicing Kung Fu and how, what you can experience in, in the, in the feeling. Because as I said, I practiced until this point, I had already two years of, um, another style of Taiji style practice, um, Fu Taiji, not so common, commonly known. Um, and, but my practice was very like, yeah, like doing the form three, four times, then learning the, after I was quite okay in this form, I learned the next form. So it was very form based, the training. And this was the first time I really practiced uh, basic base that I was really practicing one basic for a very long time. And it changed the whole uh, feeling in all the forms I knew and I learned to this point. And it was even um, that I knew our first form here in this school, the 36 tidy trend. I learned it already before this period. And I didn't practice, practice it much in this half a year. But after this half a year, I went back to the form and it was a complete different form. And I, I felt like how I jumped in half a year from my movement and uh, yeah, um, connectivity level, I would say. Yeah. 
so I experienced a completely different feeling through that. And this was, I think, my first very strong experience here and where it really made click, okay, there's something happening if you just do something for, for a very long time, uh, regular. And if, if you go also through these difficult phases, these phases where you really don't want to do it anymore. And from, from this time on, I, I pro progressed always like this in my, my training or mostly. It brings a much deeper understanding to the body, I think, when you train that way. But it is difficult to do. It can be aggravating. Yes, yes. because I think often that the problem is that um, we learn many movements and the movements are in a way distracting us from looking to deeper things, right? To more subtle things. And if you stop being distracted all the time by new movements, but you just give yourself more time to new movement, to the old movement that you have, um, and really minimalistic movement, you can really bring the attention to completely different things than uh, always being distracted by the long movement pattern in a form or uh, like new new movement that you learn and that you need to master now first. So in those days at the at Wudong Deutschland, was your training the same every day? Did you did you always start out with Tai Chi or Qigong and then practice something else in the middle of the day and then something later in the day or did the curriculum change from day to day? Um, the, our schedule was changing like more like half year yearly, I would say. Exactly. And the time I came, um, the, the morning started with some stances, drills. We learned there uh, some basic stances. It was more like uh, the buildup of, I would say, like an outer base of Kung Fu practice. And then we had also, after that, um, 13 pillars Qigong, which is a chi two hours Qigong set where you just stand in pillars. And this was for me also uh, almost, it was uh, breaking me, I would say, because I knew that standing pillar is a thing in, in, in internal uh, martial arts. But I was back then I was fighting with this with Hunyan Drang for 10 minutes. And it was for me like almost impossible to stand it 10 minutes. And even more that I came from a medical background, yeah, studying this with how muscles work and how everything in the body functions. It was for me like, okay, a muscle has to to contract and release to get oxygen. So you stand there and you just, you know, it was for me not understandable also how this can work that you stand so long. Um, and there suddenly we were standing two hours and this posture was inside this two hours, half an hour. And uh, suddenly I could do that, even so I wasn't able to do it before um, just because someone forced me to do it. But I needed a bit this, yeah, forcing and going like some a group of people um, motivate me and my teacher back then also a bit like forcing me to do it. And um, yeah, this was another important part in this training yeah, and then the tidy steps in the morning and in the evening um, training here, because usually we have like around four hours in the morning, then four hours in the evening. Um, we have then our regular, regular classes and this is changing every day, but the morning usually stays in, in a certain structure back then uh, basic stances, standing Qigong and Taiji steps. And then uh, comes the, in the evening, more like the, yeah, I would say the classes with evening students also from outside. And there the training is changing really every class. Same topics, but always a bit like different emphasizes to, yeah. How many students were there at the school back then, live-in students, full-time? When I came, there were not so many students, I think. I don't remember exactly, but it was around... Um, Eight students, I would say, oh. six to eight students. It's a good group. <clears throat> a lot of individual attention there. So yes, how, yes. how long did you train at the school before you ended up going to China to uh, train with Ismet there, right? Yes. Um, I think I trained around um, uh, one year. Then we went together to China also. With, with the group of people that have been here, we went for three months to China to visit Ismet. And um, yeah, in this three, three months, I realized I want to go back and be more in China. And um, I think I came back another year then to Germany. And then st I started a period of really uh, being more constant in China. And then I was around, uh, I think all in all, I was three years in China. Three years. What was the training like there? Was it much different than what you'd been doing in Germany? Mm. Yeah, I I think not really for me. I have to say, 
that mean it was different in the sense of you were a bit more isolated because you're in Berlin, you're really in the middle of the city and you you have to take care for a few more things also. You're a bit more confronted with the normal life, I would say, which makes it sometimes even a bit more hard. And I would say from the, for me at least, for the inner learning, the living, you know, and the handling of life, I would call it, was this sometimes here even stronger in Berlin? Um, but but uh, the focus was in China, of course, a bit more there then because it was really just training. We, we didn't even need to cook. We had there a cook that was cooking for us. And, um, and so you could put all your attention into training, sleeping and, and resting, which, which for me, I tried to keep similar also in, in Berlin. Um, but yeah, I think in the end, uh, very similar, but maybe a bit more focused in in uh, in China. But yeah, that is the, how the training was built. I think was also very similar. Morning more like qigong and basics, and then in the evening we were more focusing on uh, form training and um, uh, also com combat training. So you you mentioned Tai Chi. Um, what what point in your um education did you start also studying uh, bagua and uh, shini was this the all at the same time period or did they come later um yeah like um i started to uh, practice taiji um i think half a year i was uh, doing really focusing on taiji but at the same time i was learning already also sword and uh, bagua uh, and some other styles um Xingyi wasn't really present in this in the school back then it was just uh, one or two other um, students that learned it previously with Ismet and practice it for themselves and so I started to learn it from them a bit because I was really interested in this minimalistic approach of the five elements and also the Fali development that was a big focus in this and so slowly more and more I fell in love with uh, Xingyi and so after like I would say half a year maybe one year of Taiji focus I then started to uh, focus myself more on Xingyi and um, went then into like a two to three year, three years um, period of focused uh, Xingyi practice. And yeah, I say focus because I always practice a bit also the other thing next to it. Yeah, my Taiji never, I never stopped my Taiji to practice a bit for myself next to the uh, training schedules. I also, the Bagua was something that was always present and the sword. Um, and also com competitive uh, training, but yeah, the the minor, minor uh, uh, the the main focus of my my day was then on on Xingyi for three years, and um, then actually I did like a one two years, uh, let's say even three years phase of what, where fighting was my main focus. I I did an um, MMA fight and was preparing for this fight around half a year. And um, in this fight, I realized, okay, my ground game need to improve. This is then why I, why I focused then for one year on, on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And then uh, six years ago, it was the same time I also uh, was taking on the school here. It was then the time where I started to focus really on Bagua and uh, develop the Bagua for myself. Yeah, I am. Um... I wanted to say I really appreciate your approach to uh, teaching Xing Yi. I've watched some of your Xing Yi videos on your YouTube channel, and I really like the systematic way that you, your, your San Tisha video is a very good video. Um, I, I like the way that you teach. It's very, very Thank scientific. You. Appreciate it. Um, and I also did notice that you do do a lot of cross training. You've done some kickboxing and jujitsu and things like that. Um, when you started working on those more combative style martial arts, was there ever a temptation to move into just doing that as opposed to spending a lot of your time on the more traditional internal arts? Or did you just see that as something to augment your skills? Um, yeah, I think for me, it was always a big focus, the, the martial aspect of the art. Like we in Wudang, we say, we want three things in our martial art. Um, we have the spiritual aspect, we have the health aspect, and we have the martial aspect. And for me, this was very much resonating from the very beginning. And I would say even before I, I became Ismet student and Raphael student, uh, it was something that was in me that I was always looking for, not just martial art, but the whole package that, that contains like the, the inner development Develop, development of energetical development but also the, the martial development 
And so this completeness of being a martial artist was, I think, from, from the age to 12 was already in my awareness and something I really was looking for. And also the reason then why I, why I came to this place here, because I felt like, okay, this place is actually offering that. And um, so it was even so in my, in my Taiji fa phase, in my, my Xingyi phase, in my uh, MMA phase, I think it, it was always there. So like the inner practice was, was in my MMA phase always, what I found reason why the inner martial arts helped me for the outer martial arts now, the, the competitive martial arts and also the other way around. Um, when I was focusing more on, on Taiji I was, or Xingyi, I was also always looking for, okay, but how does this translate into fighting and how does fighting again, uh, the, or the, the, the mindset for fighting is helping me for these arts. So it's somehow, I think for me, it was never a question of, will I do now just outer martial arts? Will I just do BJJ now? But it was always for me more to look like, okay, how do I connect these things? Yeah, I think that's the proper attitude to have. I think a lot of people are missing either one or the other. They go too far to one side, too far to the other side. Um, you mentioned that you studied Aikido when you were younger. Uh, I also studied Aikido when I was younger. And I found that when I began doing Bagua, that my Aikido practice had helped my Bagua. Did you did you find that your um, Aikido had, had helped your Bagua at all? As in, you know, for instance, I could see the applications within the forms right away. You know, you can see where the joint locks and the throws and things like that are. Did you have that experience at all? Yeah, yeah. It was always told to me that um, Aikido was influenced by Bagua and that it has some connection. But I think uh, in the beginning, I really didn't see it and understood it because I, I think I also didn't understood Bagua really. It's super complex and... In the, I think in the first period, Vago uh, was just annoying for me. I, I think it was the, in my first year of practice here in the school, it was the thing I liked the least, to just walk in a circle uh, the whole session and then doing a bit the, the movements. Um, so I think I didn't saw that it helped me in the in the beginning. It just started now that when I started to really focus and dive deep, deeper into uh, Bagua and also teach it and get very... Um, aware of the application and also the application of Bagua is a big focus of, of my training and my what I what I teach here at the school now. And this is when I realized, okay, wow, um, there's so much similarity and I, I feel almost like now I understand Aikido better, you know. <laughs> I can really see how, how Aikido was uh, influenced by Bagua and uh, maybe, maybe now even I use it a bit to influence Bagua back with yeah. my my old aikido influences um not consciously but i think it's just also in my body and uh, it's very interesting for me to see how these two uh, resonate with each other and yeah um so yeah i can completely agree with this very interesting that you made the same i can uh, see it in your practice because you you know in, on your videos when you're doing bagua your throws and joint locks and things like that i i didn't know until today that you've done aikido but i i watched your videos and I said, he looks like he's done some aikido before <laughs> sure. yeah but the thing is also my aikido wasn't really good you know i i think i started aikido with 12 and i really i really didn't understood aikido actually um i think even i stopped aikido when i was around well, five years after when i was 17 and um, I think until this point, I I went out of Aikido and I, I didn't really had it in my body or I didn't felt like I took much from there. Um, because also, I think in the, my first two, three years in Aikido, it was just too overwhelming for me. I was really not movement. Um, I was I was coming from from three to nine i was also playing soccer i was this was more my 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 sport focus i would say and my coordinative skills were super uh like they were not developed at all when i came to aikido and i practiced with a group of only adults in my city older older people also uh, mainly and and it was just overwhelming with me and i couldn't also maybe their language how they explained i didn't have experience teaching it to children um, so it was for me very difficult. It was the pure will of wanting to learn martial art that I did it for five years, I think. But uh, if I look back now, back to this now, um, I, I can say I, I didn't really learn Aikido. <laughs> it was more for me the, the door opener to the martial art world and to open my coordinative skills. Because through that, then when I came to other martial arts, I had suddenly 
very good uh, ability to look and learn from through looking and to, to have approach to movement. Like people told me then I'm I'm talented in movement, but back then I think the people that taught me Aikido that they didn't thought I'm talented, uh, but more the opposite that I'm a difficult case. And um, yeah, it almost feels like now through the through the Bagua I I uh, I start to understand Aikido <laughs> and appreciate it even more. It's interesting. So you ended up taking sort of the responsibilities at Wudong Deutschland in 2017. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, was that something that you wanted to do at that time? Or was it sort of, you know, you, you, you had to do it because there was no one else to do it? How did that come about? Mm, I think, yeah, I think also, again, like, since I'm 12, I, I know I want to do martial art for my for my living and for my life and i want to have i knew back then already i want to be part of a community like this and i also want to at a certain point have my own own school like that so it was for me very clear that i want this all the time it's just in the in the time that um rafael stopped or wanted to uh, stop with the school um i i learned about like uh I don't know exactly how to say in English, but like I have a hip, um, hip dysplasia. I don't know if you can say this. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and I learned from, from uh, like a quite um, profound professor here in Berlin, in the university, that I actually need like really a uh, very big operation. And he told me, like, look, you need to do this operation. You will not be able to uh, do anything for at least one year. And um, yeah. And when I talked with, with physiotherapists about it that, uh, that knew a bit about it, they told me, okay, look, um, this operation is also not good. They wouldn't do it. Um, so it was for me the back then quite devastating time that I realized, okay, I have like a problem with my hip. And I also, it was on a quite bad state back then already because I trained for six years full power into like the full, full day into all the things and i always had this pain my whole life in my hip but I, it was always for me like okay i just need to open and stretch my hips and it's normal um and it was back then that i realized okay actually i did a mistake i i went into something very violently and i tried to very violently open something that is just uh, physiologically not possible in my body and i destroyed my hip joints uh, through that and so back then in this time, I was thinking about actually um, uh, studying Chinese or going a bit like more to the university and, and study something more to, to go another path and do the martial arts more something, letting it get something smaller in my life. But then when Rafi told me, look, I want to, I will most likely close the school here. It was for me suddenly very clear that, um, that this is what I will do and that, uh, if I if I'm allowed to do it, if if they, if uh, Rafi and also Ismet think that I can do that, that I I will take the responsibility here and and do this. And um, also Rafi has a bit history with his hips in this, so he also was like um, not sure if it's a good idea. Um, but my argument back then was, look, if if I have a chance now to do this for a couple of years, my dream to live my dream then this is my chance now. And uh, so I will be very happy to do it, even if it means that I I have to stop after three years again because of my hips and and then that's it. Um, so yeah, but now maybe to complete this, um, I didn't do the operation that the doctors um, recommended me. I And I tr I'm now more on a path of trying to handle with my medical knowledge, with my uh, physiotherapy experience to handle the thing to maintain it as good as possible, to adjust also a bit my martial art to it, to be now more smart and and to see that I, um, yeah, uh, in worst case, maintain it to the latest moment. So I can then do a hip replacement if, if it has to be done or um, or even to make it better. This I also am uh, not completely uh, giving up yet. <laughs> good for you. That was a That was a big test for you. Yes, also something I, I often think and I say that it was for me coming actually in the right time because when I did it with all that in the back of my head, I, I knew that this is what I really want, right? If, uh, yeah. Well done. 
<clears throat> has the uh, have, has the curriculum of the school changed much since you took it over? Have you made any significant changes, or is it uh, more or less the way that it was when you were a student there yourself? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it was always changing, so it's a bit difficult to say is it different because like there were really very different periods in the school. For, from my view, I, I would say both is correct. I think I changed many things like but maybe more subtle things not so uh not so from the outside very visible things but like this like for example in the morning four hours and evening four hours it's more or less the same and uh, it's more like in the detail that things change that i think uh, certain things are a bit more strict now here um, um than back then i really take care that that uh the, the schedule is followed and that people do that, get their program and know exactly what they do. And I think this was a bit more open um, in some periods that I was practicing here. And then also my, sometimes the reason why, why people had problems to really stay in training or um, like it was sometimes a bit unclear. There were many people also uh, living here that, yeah, that had problems to train. And nowadays I would say if someone really cannot train enough it's very clear in the school that then it's not the right place um not in a bad sense but also in a sense of I, I i think like it's not helping anyone not the people that want to train if there are people not able to follow up the, the schedule but also um for the people themselves because i think like if you're here and you invest all your time into this you should really use this time and if you are um then more like half in half out it's better actually better to just continue with your life and and uh i mean you can he also always practice here in other frames right you don't need to be in the full-time hardcore frame and but you can also do like a teacher training once a month you can do like even in courses uh, every uh, every evening yeah what would you say to a person a prospective student who wanted to come to the uh full-time live-in program how would you describe how would you describe how the program program works from from uh, day one, what would someone mm. expect? <clears throat> yeah, I think the most important is to to come open to actually not not expect too much um, to also plan more time than you thought it it takes because I yeah we are not teaching here like in a very fast way it is it has its own rhythm the training and it doesn't matter um, how much time you you bring necessarily. Um, there's a rhythm in the school and 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 how we teach and also to maybe come with the least the wish of learning rather less than more yeah and um, not like planning now okay I want to learn the full first full Taiji form and then this this and this but if for example um, like someone comes for longer you can be sure for the first half year maybe even the first year you will do the Taiji steps through my experience, every student that comes now here is starting like that with uh, tidy step training, and um, and also that this is not always fun. Yeah, that like maybe in the beginning it's fun, but at a, at, at a certain point it's also just work, and um, and also to be ready for this, that uh, that is actually work what we do here. Of course, very nice work because you, in the end, you always work on yourself on your own development. And so it's, I think, um, very valuable work. But at the same time, also, it is hard work. And it is some, sometimes you lose also the perspective. And uh, in these times, it's very, very important to, to know why you're doing that and also to, to maintain a certain patience and, and calm mind, I would say, um, to not lose track. And then, yeah. What would you say? Or you yeah, sorry? Yeah. Huh? I'm sorry. What would you say is the average length of a stay for a student there? Is there, um, I know there are people been there quite some time. And then uh, about how long would you say a person normally stays? It's it's very uh, different, like the how, how long people stay. Like for me, the, the, the perfect would be seven years if people stay seven years. <laughs> it's more or less my, my time that I uh, was until I took over the school. But I also know that this is not really possible for most of the people. Um, <clears throat> so I think 
it doesn't matter how long you stay in the end, even a week or a couple of days is, can be very valuable if you come with the right mindset. And if you come with the mindset of taking something and then doing it for yourself. It's also what I tell people um, when they come into the full-time program for two weeks and they learn maybe the first five tidy steps mainly in this time. Then I tell them, look, when you practice this now, now for half a year and then you come back in half a year and, uh, and come another two weeks, then maybe you will not and you yeah you manage to practice this regular then you will maybe not uh, have it so different from the full-time people here because in the end um you always need to train for yourself right and uh it's maybe a bit supporting here because you have this frame you have all the people around you you have a teacher that looks on you but at the same time the work you have to do for yourself so if someone comes now for two weeks and is then after practicing this for half a year regular maybe even daily then you can come back and you will be on another different state and we can continue there. And then it can be also maybe not the same like in the full-time program, but something similar. And um, But then, so this is what I, what I would tell people that want to come for shorter, but then if people have more time and can see them doing, doing this longer, um, then of course, the longer, the better. And I would say the average, the average of people that stay longer is between one and three years. This is usually the time of, of long time stu long term students. Yeah. You mentioned that you also have the, your teacher education program. When people go through that program, and I realize it, it is probably a longer program. I think uh, um, you mentioned that even people that stay full time, you know, you expect that they would be there at least three years. I think something along those lines. Um, when 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 I uh, when a student becomes certified as a teacher under you, do they go and start their own schools? Do you have schools that are affiliated with your home school there in Berlin, or do they or do they teach there? Um, I think it's it's now uh, slowly starting um, that this is happening, um, at least for my for my uh, period when I took the school. That now slowly there are people because it takes time, right? And I do the school now for bit more than six years um, that people are on the level that they um, can start to to teach and to also to really start to open their own own thing and um, so we have now uh, with uh, Stasia is starting something in in Greece more and more in Athens someone that was here for three to I'm not sure three or I think even four years she was here and um yeah, and also in Switzerland, we have, have Tugdual that was longer here. So we have a couple of places now that start, where they start slowly. Um, but I would say it's still in the very beginning that the first people that come from this education and the, the way I, I do it in this very long-term yeah, uh, uh, view, that they start to to come out of, of, of this um, work that we do here. And yeah, it's, it's, it's right, like, because for, it's, I would say, until I give people like uh, this, this teacher certificate is at least three years. And usually I think even you should calculate more into the four years. Um, and then in the, in the teacher training as also, I make it, as you say already, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm super uh, thankful for all the research you did. You know, all these things. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I tell them, look like be realistic Um and it's not about, in the end, my teacher training program is not about becoming very fast a teacher. It's about having a regular frame of practice and eventually will end up in being a teacher. Um, and for these people, of course, they, they need to calculate. And if, if a full-timer needs three years with eight hours training a day, then, okay, you need to, to calculate how long this takes in another frame and how much time you put in into the training. And I think in the end, there's, it's not really a shortcut because what makes... The things that I want to see, what makes them um, appear is this time, is time, is this uh, Kung Fu, you know, to go through something with time and also a bit hardship and uh, and, uh, and this, there, there is no shortcut. It's also something I tell people, like when they are, feel like they're very untalented, untalent, I always tell them, hey, it's no problem, you know. Because there are people that learn very, very fast in the beginning and people that really have problems in the beginning to get in. And uh, maybe in the beginning, it appears like the people that are very talented are running away from everyone and have a very high level um, after one, two years, while the others need much, much longer. But I think in the long term, it, it doesn't matter 
how how talented you've been in the beginning because this is what I what I want to see in our practice and what is what I think makes also Wudang principles special is coming or internal martial arts maybe also uh, is is just coming through this time and through this hard work and uh, it's not connected to how fast you catch movement and um, how talented you are and so my experience is even the people that are very talented sometimes have problem with this with patience because they are very fast on a point and then they think okay i have it and what next right, right. and they don't learn this patience uh, or they don't have the reason for patience because they think i'm doing it already good and the people that have much more difficult in uh difficulty in learning the things and, and progressing they have a bit more things to bite on and therefore also are more willing to invest the time and then in my experience also even more likely, yeah, go through this time because they don't think now, okay, I have nothing to do anymore. I'm almost there already. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now I went a bit in another direction. Sorry. What was the question? No, that, that, you know, that, that's, uh, I've seen that many times in my own life. I've seen people that are very naturally talented and they um, get the movements quickly and it, they, it has no value for them. So they stop, you know, yes. uh, came too easily. And then people who seem hopeless when they start out, but they keep with it, you know, and 20 years later, they're still doing martial arts, you know, because they had to work hard for it. I kind of think that's the whole point in the end, you know, it's like you yeah. said, the work, the effort over time that we put into it. Yes. So what do you see as the future of these traditional arts uh, moving forward? What do you think is their place in the world today? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yes, like second, um, I think first of all, I see, I see I see a very good future with this art. I think it's really something that uh, will come more and more again, um, that it's the people, the more, the more, the, like, like, the more things are distracting us, the more we are again looking for for ourselves, and the more we are getting out of balance in life. And this, I feel, like is happening a lot through this fast piece of life, a fast pace of life. And the more we are also looking again for arts that bring us back. And I think the internal martial arts are very much um, offering that. But also um, for the martial for, for, for the martial arts, I think is something that is that will find its way back again through practitioners that bring a lot of honesty also to it. That again place the inner martial arts on their on their place and and um, yeah, also are very honest with themselves and maybe also starting to become more interested in in external and combative arts. And then I think also the internal martial arts have very much their place there that um, they have the ability to make us practice also fighting arts and fighting more healthy and more uh, long-term, like um, so long-term in the sense of that we're not destroying the body and um, yeah, that we can also with the time maybe bring bring these things back to um, sports, I would say. This, this, this knowledge of, okay, how can I use my body more, more healthy, more connected, and long term also in a way that is very efficient and and uh, uh, bring the body more into balance instead of unbalancing the body. And I think also for yeah, as I say, like for the martial arts, this is something that will find more more interest in the future again. I I totally agree. So we're just about out of time. Would you like to tell people where they can find you at your your social media links and so forth? Um. Like the website is maybe the easiest. First of all, um, it is at uh, schön fude This is our website. You can find everything, how it works with the teacher program, our evening classes, but also how to join here for a full-time uh, period. And then on social media, yes, you also find us on Instagram under schön kung fu academy or Facebook or YouTube. Um, there also schön kung fu academy. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm super happy. To right. see you yeah, we'll put links to all those in the description for the video too. Thank so you. you can find yeah. out all about that. You have a great uh, organization and a great YouTube channel too. And you guys put a lot of work into that. So Steve, thank thanks you. a lot for joining me today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Can you stick around for just a minute? Yeah. Thank you, Bill, for yeah. having me here. Thanks. It was really nice. Thank thanks to everybody for uh, listening.